In terms of uh, history and the current situation, um, you know, human beings have an aversion to killing each other. That's been proven. Uh, having said that, uh, yes, there are people out here who commit crimes of, uh, against humanity and atrocities, but there are also people out here who, witnessing that, stop it, attempt to stop it. I just want to comment on, on that. But I just want to put a couple of things in perspective. In America, we have 25% of the world's prison population. 25%. That's uh, 200,000 whites, 600,000 Latinos, and 1.5 million black men in prison. In Germany, which is a country of about 82 to 85 million people, we have 80,000 people in prison. In America, we have 40,000 black women in prison, which represents 50% of the prison population in Germany. There's a movement in America. The reason I why I bring this up is there, there's a movement in America. And it's, uh, it has a slogan, mass incarceration plus silence equals genocide. Now, within the context of that, um, I think that that issue should be, in the context of this forum here, uh, I think that issue should be raised because if we're going to have an effort, an endeavor uh, to eradicate uh, crimes against humanity and among them genocide, then we have to be uh, impartial and, unba and unbiased in our application of what we stand for. Just to put it in perspective, I'm a Vietnam veteran. We lost 60,000 people in Vietnam. In America, every year, on average, 25,000 people die as a result of gun deaths. That's not including the people who are wounded. And if you talk about the people who are wounded and the gun deaths together, we're talking about a figure between 90,000 and 100,000 a year. America is a country, a society at war with itself. And I think that one needs to look at that situation. Why is that? Why, and someone mentioned that uh, uh, there were some casualties in one part of the conflict zone here um, in Croatia or in Slovenia, or Kosovo, of 8,000 people being slaughtered. You know, which is, I, I, I denounce that, I condemn that 100%. There's no question about that. One death is one too many. But we seem to not to notice the horrific numbers, the bloodshed in one of the, highly, high, one of the most highly developed countries technologically, uh, so to speak, in the world. We, we just deny that. Every year, 100,000 people are, killed, are either killed or injured by gun uh, confrontations. Why is this? Why does this happen? Is this, in fact, uh, uh, a hallmark of, uh, of genocide? Uh, is the fact that we have 25% of the world's prison population, what does that, how does that speak to the question of genocide that some people in America would maintain? Why is there this aversion to talking about all the problems that exist, exist in all these countries across the board without being uh, myopic? And I'm not saying that this group is, because I, I applaud the efforts of this group. There's no question about it. This is a fledgling group. It's a new group that's trying to forge a new path. And I'll do everything in my power to assist it in that effort. But I think that we need to, this group does not need to make the same mistake perhaps that other groups have made in not recognizing the plight of people in the United States and in other countries, and in other countries around the world. But specifically, because I'm from this country, uh, the United States, this question also needs to be addressed and we have to talk about uh, genocide or the lack thereof in America also. Uh, it was a question why some people are killing other people. Why it happened? A human being is a potential, potential for everything, for good and bad. Man can produce evil, 
like to be Hunter. And what less the other things are happening to the good behavior. One of the elements for committing crime, such as it, it is the case of giving, on one side is education, that even education cannot save the person not to be killed, the killer to be murdered. But again, education might help people to, religion might help people not to do evil things. But it can be mentioned now, guns. Availability of uh, weapons is making it easier. The United States of America is having laws having right, citizen has the right to have a gun. It might be good, it might be bad, I don't think I think it's good. Except when it is military or what have you. One of the problems called the genocide is in the cases of dictatorship <clears throat> and so on and countries with not due respect for the human rights, is to be, to have our arms. Next discussion to this, in prevention genocide, or, or uh, amount of genocide or, or atrocities, is not to make it available to have so many arms at hand, passing to act is well developed discipline in criminology by having gun at home you might easily turn to it i have been minister and i was told that the war was around and i was told minister would you like to have a gun you know we are war i said no thank you they they wanted to be give me a Policeman staying at, at, at my home, I said, thank you very much. So I, I hate arms, and I believe that the arms, they are not to be blamed, but to have too easy access to arms is a, one of the elements of passing to the act, not in the cases of genocide. So this was my reaction. Very quickly, I think you know the, the global center that I work for. Part of its brief is to apply the RCP lens to situations without prejudice or, or privilege. So, but in doing so, we, we constantly have to reflect on what that means, and we have to be very focused on the legal definitions of the of crimes as they are encapsulated in the, in the Roman statute, and look at situations where. Um, they're either threatened or there's imminent risk of those crimes or where those crimes are um, currently taking place. And that can sometimes mean that you bump into people in an unfortunate way. I mean, I would just give as a, a very quick example of that, um, the situation with uh, Rwanda, who have been a very, very good country. They've come out of the genocide themselves and rebuilt their country. They've been very, very good on RTP at the UN, have been a, a, a leading voice internationally and a very important voice in Africa support and responsibility to protect. And now there's increasing evidence that they're heavily implicated in mass atrocity crimes by the M23 movement in, in the Cubans in, uh, in, uh, in the Eastern mm -hmm. Congo. Uh, the group of experts report, I think, is uh, fairly uh, convincing. Also a situation in Burma where there's a lot of pressure from people because of the reform situation to keep quiet about the situation in Burma. And we've been speaking about that for quite a while. And then now, just in the last four months, I think we've got to push against the tendency to apply the genocide label um, loosely if we can. I think sometimes people apply, can in some circumstances apply the, the genocide label. What they're really trying to say is this situation is really, really bad, or this.
this is a very, very gross human rights violation. And that's, uh, uh, so we've got to be very, very careful about that. We try to strict, stick to the strict uh, legal, legal definition. So for example, at no point in the crisis in Syria over the last 18 months have we ever used the word genocide. I do not believe what's happened in Syria is a genocide. There are mass atrocity crimes. They fit the definition of crimes against humanity. They also fit the definition of, of war crimes given the uh, current civil war. But it's not a genocide. Just very quickly on the issue of the relationship between the field and the office, I, I agree with you that there's often a disjunction which, which needs to be addressed, and it needs to be addressed by, uh, by all of us. And I think where these things work best are where, where there's a, uh, a dynamic relationship between the one thing and the other, and I've, I've seen that go both ways. So, for example, you know, um, one of our things, we, we put out a publication called the RTP Monitor, which is uh, for policymakers and it circulates with governments in the UN, but anybody can sign up for it, and I encourage anybody here to go to our website and sign up for it if you're interested in these issues. But you know, we would develop these uh, analyses based on information we would get in New York, but then we would always want to check it against people in the fields, and that's one of the things that's so important. So we develop these necessary actions, recommendations for policy makers, and then you'd be amazed sometimes when you talk to people in the field and they say, the real issue for us in, in South Kivu, in the DRC at the moment, it's not so much these big issues that you're talking about, but it's actually spare parts for helicopters. Um, because we don't have spare parts, and because no country will give us spare parts for the helicopters, we can't actually uh, fulfill our mandate of civilian protection properly because we don't have enough work for the helicopters. So it can sometimes literally come down to uh, nuts and bolts issues uh, that, that people in New York don't necessarily know about. But I think the reverse is true as well, is that sometimes when you're in the field, and I, I um, done some field work myself, you can be so focused by the situation immediately in front of you, directly in front of you in terms of the protection of this group of civilians or this particular crisis in this particular village that, that you're based in, whatever, that you can actually lose sight of the bigger picture, uh, an analysis of the, of the of larger developments and a prognosis of, of threats that are emerging. So I think, yeah, there has to be a dynamic relationship between the, the two things. Thank you very much, Dr. Adams. Well, as I suggest we do now, we're running about 15 minutes to meet. However, the final panel discussion is about half the size of this panel discussion. I know, Professor Miner, you prepared some slides, and I think you fit in very well with this panel. So if everyone would agree, I'd say, let's go maybe another five minutes. Perhaps you could show us those slides. Right, let's take the next one after that. Or would it fit in with the next one? All right. So, yeah, I'd say, I mean, I think it's more relevant to this panel. I think if everyone agrees, that's just what I can ever be regarding the responsibility to use terms and legal terms properly and not to get carried away. Um, having this, this, yeah, nothing. Yeah. And then the other one. Okay. It's over. Uh, the, I think it's incredibly important to use these terms responsibly. As the Prime Minister mentioned this morning, Rob Lefkin, um, Lefkin spent, uh, his life hundreds of years trying to find a way to use terms that were responsible. Um, and that's something that we need to continue to do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you for the term genocide, but it's, I think it's an insult to all those people who suffer under genocide. And so I'd be very wary of throwing that word around um, uh, loosely. Uh, on that note, um, let me just, we, since the focus of the panel is on international institutions, I thought I'd put together a couple slides, um, basically to talk a bit about um, the Libyan case in Syria. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Um, a lot of people um, in many communities like look at Libya and say, well, perhaps this is a precedent. Perhaps we can look at this and, and learn further Libya, apply it. And I'd be cautious to do that because I think Libya is a very special case. Um, next slide. Um, when you're looking at Syria, it's, it's a very complex place, but I think there's a lot of differences between Syria, the leadership, and also the leadership in Libya and how it interacts with the rest of the world. Next slide. Um, this guy. Uh, was a very unique character. Uh, he had a practice of bad behavior. He funded terrorism around the world. He was uh, alleged to help the IRA um, its um, apps. And, uh, he was behind, in many ways, the downing of Pan on the three, which is um, the terrorist bomb case that took down an airplane that was thought to be Scotland, and actually served on the US delegation to that trial uh, in, in Holland. And I think when he decides to stand up and make indications of what's going to happen in Gazi. It put the world on notice that someone who might have passed bad behavior, passed track record of terrorism, 
might be quite dangerous in his own population, uh, which I think stated the change perspective immensely. Next slide. Uh, so much so that it grabbed the UN's attention. And for any of us who work with the UN, we know that uh, the UN is not always the most eager to jump into something. Um, but it highlighted the, the concern for many people around the world. And so they decided to, to be actively involved in passing the regular resolutions. I think also what's unique in this case is you have members of the, the White House in the United States who worked in the Clinton administration and had lived through this, what happened in Bosnia and the Balkans and had sworn to themselves that never again would this happen on their watch. And I think this motivated people immensely to be proactive, uh, which is the reason I think you had so much support behind the resolutions for Libya. Um, and indeed, you had sanctions as well. Next slide. Uh, and unique in this case also was the fact that you had a referral to the International Criminal Court for, to investigate the matter. Um, and I think that, that the fact that you had a world leader like Gaddafi, who was being investigated by the ICC, which is a relatively uh, new institution, raised the spectrum in terms of uh, him being basically an outlaw, uh, persona not brought up in the world. And I think the fact that many governments decided to freeze his assets and immediately ch changed the perspective in many ways. Next slide. Um, I think also what is unique about Gaddafi was the way that his past behavior in supporting terrorism interacted with his role in the region. Next slide. Uh, in many ways, I think Gaddafi saw himself as a leader of Africa. Uh, and you can see this in terms of the funding he spent on many governments, um, and in fact, his close relationships um, with many governments, some of whom uh, were very late to freeze his assets, I think, because of their personal relationships with Gaddafi. Um, but I think that fact uh, was interesting in terms of how he interacted with other international institutions. Next slide. Um, one of the reasons he had a challenging relationship with some of his neighbors is because there are allegations that he tried to kill one of his neighbors, in his assassination sense. Indeed, this gives you a bad reputation. And, and one where when neighbors are likely to help other neighbors, they may be reluctant to do so. And I think that was the case uh, with Qaddafi. Next slide. So much so that you had a regional body who decided to be proactive and actually to, to ask for the world support, ask for NATO support uh, directly, and basically trying to resolve the situation. Next slide. And I think the fact that you have a regional body reaching out to another regional body, being NATO, provides excellent support and basically provides guidance and helps policymakers. And again, um, our colleague discussed the importance of the political will and political decision making. And having worked uh, at the Pentagon and having gone to a number of NATO meetings myself, I can tell you that the fact that these institutions are able to work together is incredibly impressive. Um, the, the fact that you had folks in Europe, folks in North America, the United States, and others uh, who wanted to be active and had partners in the region were incredibly important. Next slide. So much so that you had folks in NATO working with United Arab Emirates and others to actually have combat missions and have combat support missions and to be actively involved in this. I think it changed the perspective uh, immensely. Next slide. And I think what it comes back to, just to kind of highlight the topic um, of this panel, is the fact that in many ways, in order to be responsive to the occurrences of the world, you have to work through international institutions. They are there for a reason. If we didn't have them, we'd have to recreate them. And so I'll simply leave in this note that it is a matter of political will. It is a matter of countries working with their populations. But it does so under the umbrella of international institutions, which is why I'm so glad this, is, this organization, this country, and everyone here today is focused on the world, how we collectively work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, much uh, for doing the panel. And uh, no, I'd like. Um, and we're finishing off with a very fascinating panel uh, focused on civil society and working with NGOs. Uh, I think you know all our speakers, so I will save time for a discussion. But I wanted to open the floor to our minister um, for his opening remarks, and then from there we'll go to questions and answers. Mr. Minister. Thank you very much, Mark. <clears throat> Excuse me, I lost my voice. Um, the last panel is dealing with social, civil, civil society, NGO, and the peace in relation to the peace. For civil society, it has been written that it is the arena 
where people associate to advance common interests. Uh, it is an old notion, notion from the antique time. Uh, in the Roman, it was Societas Civilis, introduced by Cicero. And during the medieval time, they lost, the notion has been lost. They have discussed problems like the just war and so on. Uh, the actual meaning of the concept of civil society has changed first after the French Revolution, the second after the fall of communism. Uh, next to it is the, the, are the NGOs, non-governmental organizations. The term originated from the UN and is normally used to refer to organizations that are not a part of the government. It is voluntary, non-state, non-profit, non-religious, and non-military association. It is astonishing how many NGOs are there in the world. In India, in the year 2009, 2009 there have been 3.3 million of different NGOs. In Russia, more than 200,000 NGOs. In USA, 40,000. Now, the question might be, how happened? How is with the funding? That was, it's one of our uh, topic here. Funding is the for the small or large, it's various, it depends. Some of the NGOs are supported by the governments, like Nobel Prize winner Doctors Without Borders get 46% of its income from the government sources. Several EU, EU grants provide funds accessible to NGOs. If we bring NGOs to the peace problem, to keep peace as it is on the title, I have selected some of those who have been dealing with the peace, like just to mention one, the World Federation for UN Associations. On the auspices of the UN, they have promotion of international peace and security. They are contributing to the removal of obstacles to peace. They work for justice, security and disarmament, and to promote the development of peaceful coexistence and cooperation. They have two projects. One, it has been discussed several times here, responsibility to protect. Dr. Adams knows it, everything about it. <laughs> and the second project is the Zero World Disarmament Problem. When we have been discussing the problem of the arms, guns, and other things, probably one of the next topics for the ICD will be the problem of disarmament and proliferation of nuclear weapons and so on in order to save it from the possible terrorist attack and so on. This problem is, is there, it's present. Think about Iran or Israel who is saying that they need immediate preventive attack on Iran. It's rather dangerous to speak about nuclear weapons being used as for inside. So, Cultural diplomacy must be interested in soft power types of activities. So, rejecting possible, most brutal, catastrophic power used by the nuclear uh, weapons that are still more possibility. I would like to mention that I have been one of the founders and one of the previous president of the 
society which has special category conservative status with the ECOSOC. ECOSOC is one of the uh, UN NGO status. If you can reach it, it's important. Society I have been dealing with is it's called uh, the World Society of Victimology. It has been several times mentioned, victims, different kind of victims that have been uh, dignity of victims mentioned by Dr. Storm, dignity that lasts even after the death. This is why it's important to bring those people from the graves to the proper place to place them in peace if it is possible, as it has been seen on certain Nisa case and some other cases. So another uh, important aspect of the NGO's activities are those oriented toward the peace. Peace, which is a state of harmony characterized by the lack of violent conflict and the freedom from fear of violence and so on. There are peace movements, there are peacekeeping missions. There is a bizarre, somehow, unusual, but very interesting organization, NGO, called Peace One Day. Peace One Day. A non-profit organization with the objective to raise awareness of the International Day of Peace, which occurs on 21st September each year. The objective of the organization is Foster Peace Day as a day for wide-scale community action and a day for UN agencies and aid organizations to safely carry out life-saving work and so on. Proposal for this have been done by one Jeremy Gillis in 1998. He conceived the idea of a single day when all countries vote not to wage war and war by ceasefire and the day for, for of non-violence. Unlike Emmanuel Kant, who was looking for eternal peace, aiming his freedom, which was a good idea, but naive one. It was his experience within the first experience within Napoleon's wars. Similar destiny happened to Beethoven. So eternal peace, I like to be eternal peace, there is one day peace, but let's uh, accept it as a one of the positive action of one of the many of millions of NGOs since they are related directly to the peace. There is one UN Peace Building Commission which is established by UN General Assembly and Security Council in 2005 with the mandate you can imagine Peace Building Commission I believe that the cultural diplomacy is one of those respective organizations. Uh, according to Mark Donfried, founder and director of the ICD, there are cultural diplomacy is based on five principles, if it's good to repeat it, and I should close with this. It is respect for and recognition of cultural diversity and heritage. Second, global intercultural dialogue. Third, justice, equality, and interdependence. Fourth, protection of international human rights. And then, global peace and stability. Global peace and stability was one of the aims goals of this summit. I, mean, I believe we have added something very important to this very, very noble goal of this group and the organizer of this summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think that was an excellent way of opening this discussion. Uh, I know that these
we've spent much of our days with this panel talking, and I'd love to engage more, as Mark did in a previous panel, with you all. Uh, I know that there's also a number of students here from different faculties studying politics and foreign relations. And I know from my experience as a professor, we tend to call the students to ask, answer questions. I would invite the students of the room in particular to ask us questions. So, will any of the students like to have some questions before I call on you? <laughs> Somebody raise their hand. Uh, okay, I, 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 there you go. Um, Law in China. Um, like, uh, there's uh, in China, they, they have uh, one child per couple policy, and uh, where no brothers or sisters are allowed. And I, I wonder if you consider this like uh, an assault on women uh, and children, while because forced abortions are being made uh, even in late stages of uh, pregnancy. Uh, and this also can be considered like a sort of a genocide, genocidal act uh, against one, uh, one uh, set of human beings. Uh, quick answer is no. Um, I don't consider that a form of genocide. I think we have to be very clear about, again, as I said in the last session, what crimes are and how they're, they're codified. Does that constitute an, an imposition upon the human rights of ordinary Chinese um, in terms of women's uh, right to control their, their reproductive capacity? Yes, it is. Um, is that something that the, the, the Chinese state and the Chinese people uh, need to look at? Uh, absolutely, but I, I don't believe it constitutes uh, um, an act of genocide. If I might be able to add something to that too, uh, I'd like to make two points. First of all, I'd like to say something about civil society, uh, which can mean very different things in different contexts, namely China and the USA, where civil society can mean very different things. Secondly, I'd like to respond by uh, talking about briefly the connection between cultural diplomacy and human rights. First of all, very briefly for civil society, I think in essence, for me, the purest form of civil society is actually what happened more or less in the United States. Uh, where the American government traditionally does relatively little for its citizens in comparison to the German government or some other governments. Uh, I think it was because of those deficits where basically citizens would come together and say, hey, let's help other citizens. It's really in the purest form, that's really the, the origins, I would say, of civil society. Citizens coming together with the effort to help other citizens. Uh, independent from a government, but can also work with the government. And there are many examples in the US where one does have very good partnerships uh, between public sector and civil society. Second example uh, would be Turkey, uh, up until very recently, uh, where for a long time it was very difficult uh, to actually start NGOs and actually have civil society. There was almost a distrust on behalf of the government in the sense, hey, citizens coming together, grouping, you know, that can be dangerous. And you actually have to go to a police station and register. It was quite difficult. Uh, we did a conference in Istanbul uh, three years ago. At that point, I think it was seven or nine percent of the Turkish population participated in civil society. It's on the rise, especially with the European process. Japan would be a third, very different example. Uh, in Japan, you had no civil society until the 70s. Uh, you also had no cultural diplomacy until the 70s, where the Japanese government actually said, hey, this is something that we should have. Uh, and really a top-down approach. The Japanese government started in 1972 with the Japan Foundation uh, and set up a number of NGOs and civil society organizations with a top-down approach. So I just mentioned that, just so that we realize civil society can mean very different things in different contexts. To your point about China, I think you raise a very interesting example of actually where I think cultural diplomacy can help. Uh, in the past, uh, cultural diplomacy, to generalize, was more or less governmental, uh, more or less with the goal of how do we win the hearts and minds of foreign audiences? Uh, let's tell America's story to the world. Let's make others like us. You wouldn't talk about human rights. You wouldn't talk about difficult things. You just talk about the nice things. You send jazz musicians. And even though I have nothing against that, uh, I think really anything to do for cultural diplomacy, as we define cultural diplomacy and look to the future. We always say cultural diplomacy is firstly, how do we educate, how do we enhance, and how do we sustain relationships? Uh, secondly, it's about building dialogue, understanding, and trust. And if we want to build trust between China and Slovenia, China and USA, or any of the countries you mentioned today, trust means we need to talk about the good things and the bad things. We need to talk about our strengths, and we need to talk about our weaknesses. Uh, reconciliation has a very high potential. Uh, so as we talk about China variety violations, we mentioned that they're happening there. I think that is part, of, that should be part of cultural diplomacy. We should try to create forums in which one can, in a respectful way, and also in a humble way, discuss the 
is also difficult to pass. Uh, I think through that dialogue, progress can be made. Uh, by ignoring those issues and just talking about the positive things, I don't think we're going to make progress there. Because uh, for us, the future approach of diplomacy is really building trust. Uh, as I think Professor Sokovrich uh, pointed out earlier today, uh, there is really no truth. Or I actually think with Judge Schoen Schoenberg, uh, there is no truth in the sense that if we're looking for what is the absolute truth, I think we have to give up. Uh, we have to be humble enough to realize there are many different interpretations of the truth. There are many different interpretations of history. And our task as cultural diplomats or historians is to try to collect all of those uh, and try the best we can to make sense of the picture, realizing we will, we will never have a fully illuminated room. Uh, so in that sense, I think the, the challenge you mentioned when it came to China is maybe also a task we could give to the cultural diplomats. How one can, through cultural diplomacy, embrace uh, these difficult topics and to try to allow for further exchange, which would be ultimately a goal that one can actually improve the situation uh, and also ultimately, hopefully, save lives. So, this is a brief response in terms of civil society and what perhaps the future of cultural diplomacy could do. I support this idea of cultural dialogue and uh, going back to the question from China, it is not acceptable from the standpoint of human rights uh, to do such a thing, to have such a decision, such a policy in uh, having uh, or not having the idea what sex is it and so on. So I agree that it is by no means a question of genocide. It is influential for the newcomers, for the new babies, for the new generations, and very strong and strange decision. But this is because they are overpopulated, they believe that they should had such a policy, unlike this, in Europe, we have opposite tendencies. Then, as a, an advantage to change this negative situation in the demographical aspect, in Europe, Chinese are coming to Europe more and more quickly. One million of Turks are in Berlin. I don't know how many Chinese are now in Germany and in Europe, but I know that most, the, the biggest number of newcomers to my country, small country, are Chinese. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, this question has a little bit more to do with the previous panel discussion, however, but I suppose that my name is Virginia Hall, I come from the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. Uh, I would like to ask uh, the panel uh, about your thoughts about, we recently heard that uh, the, the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize was awarded to the European Union. Um, as the Judge Schumer uh, previously, earlier this morning, uh, pointed out that we should ask uh, what can be done on a national domestic level, then at a regional level, and finally what can be done on a uh, global level. What, uh, in your opinion, is the role of the European Union? What can be done? What, why is there not more done? Or what is your response to this uh, about also taking responsibility as as uh, one agent? Thank you. One European to start with. So very good. Let's start. I'm only a partial European. I have a European passport. <laughs> Parents, but I grew up on the other side of the world, on another continent. So, uh, but I think the EU has, has played a, uh, a positive role in the United Nations around these issues, and certainly we interact with the UN, uh, sorry, the EU delegation uh, quite closely in New York. And they actually have played a fairly positive role in terms of trying to cohere debate amongst uh, missions in New York around responsibility to protect. Issues. Um, and so, where does that become important? It becomes important at times, for example, like the European General Assembly or the interactive debate on RTD that takes place each year, where the EU will actually get together and hold meetings with uh, other with the EU group and think about the key issues that they want to raise as the EU and so forth. They're not bound by it, but they certainly discuss it. And we've generally come out to be um, a very useful process. At the moment, we're talking to the EU about the possibility of uh, them uh, appointing a focal point as an EU focal point, but also pushing it uh, amongst the EU group itself. We already have, uh, I have to look at my list, but there's already something like seven, eight, nine states in the EU that have already appointed us to be focal 
I would like only to add a comment. We have also included among NGOs those civil society which is offspring of NATO, namely the Atlantic Treaty Association, has in each country a club which is actually pursuing the ideas of democracy, human rights, etc., and spreading these ideas into the neighborhood. Another organization is pan Europe Movement, which is also a civil society based on the European Union. Both are active also in Slovenia, and they have done a lot of efforts to spread the democratic values in the peace and the knowledge about how to achieve peace and other aspects of human rights in the southeastern Europe and eastern Europe. It's worthwhile to mention their efforts and their work among the young generation. There are clubs of young athletic associations which are very, very active in this field. Thank you very much. And having participated as a young leader going to the Lisbon Summit, I can apply all your efforts in trying to include so many people so you have this experience of seeing the data summits and how they actually work. So thank you very much. Other questions? Yes, Professor. I have one comment and one question. The comment is the role of the European Union. Actually, I believe that there is a big potential in the role of the European Parliament. The European Parliament probably being one of the biggest international institutions, being directly elected, and also have a very good outreach to civil society. And the European Parliament has already taken an interest in R2P has already organized a couple of sessions on R2P. I happen to participate in two of these events and I think they were very successful and I think Slovenia should also in the future support such events even maybe more actively than in the past and I think this is also one contribution that Slovenia can give to the promotion of R2P. And the question is more relating to the topic of this session Syria crisis, and I wonder, and this is my question to everyone actually, anyone can comment on it, why in the case of Syria, where Security Council is paralyzed, obviously because of the of Russia and China as well, why um, the states haven't resorted to the United for Peace resolution, and why didn't they call for an emergency special session on the situation in Syria? So do you see what could be the reasons for not resorting to this option where it was used in the past and as we know it is used whenever the Security Council is blocked and the action is needed in order to prevent mass atrocities from happening. Thank you. And just a comment, um, obviously in General Assembly there is, there are enough votes because the resolutions that were adopted in the General Assembly were adopted with more than 131 votes necessary. To our local New Yorker. Procedural motions in the UN. I think who wants to handle these nitty gritty questions on the UN business? Um, I think as the situation in Syria has become more uh, intractable uh, and people have become more frustrated with the blockage in the Security Council, people have started looking for solutions uh, to either unblock that within the UN system or to, uh, or to, or to go around it and go uh, outside it. Um, my own view, my, my personal view, is, has been too much that debate has been uh, presented as the choice is doing nothing or military intervention. And I don't think that's the case. I think actually military intervention is a balance of consequences argument could, could actually make the situation considerably worse, um, especially in the situation that we currently have. But I don't think the choice is between doing nothing and, and F-18s or cruise missiles either. I think there's a lot more in the international community that can do. Um, on the second part of that, there, there is a, a, a growing number of people who are saying, well, why can't uh, the world, those who want to see some kind of military impact, saying, why can't the world just, just ignore the Security Council and just do it? Um, of course, we have some precedent for this, not least of all, most recently, I guess, with regards to Kosovo. Um, 
My own view on the view of Senator House of Senator on Kosovo is that was not only justifiable but is but illegal under international law. And you either have a rules based international order or you don't have a rules based international order. I happen to believe in a rules based international order. Um, but the reality also is that there are plenty of ways in which if, if countries really wanted to militarily intervene in Syria at the moment, they could. So for example, the, the cross-border fire into Turkey could easily cause Turkey to uh, invoke protection under the, under the NATO charter. It doesn't want to, and nobody wants Turkey to do that because they actually don't want to get into a military conflict in Syria. So there's a little bit of a straw man argument as well that some of these countries kind of presenting that it's only Russia and China who are stopping them from otherwise doing it, whereas that's just not true. They have no appetite uh, for it. And for good reasons, because they see that it, it could actually make the hardship on civilians worse and could actually aggravate the situation even further. This, the first part of your question is, is I think, um, in, in many ways, the, the more intriguing one is one I, I get asked more and more. I recently gave a speech in uh, Germany, and it was a question uh, from the floor in, in Germany as well. Why not give out for peace? There is a precedent for this, most notably uh, during the Korean War. Um, and you're right about the votes. So for example, the last vote I think that was held in the General Assembly, which was in um, August, uh, there was a Syria resolution, and I think it was 143 to like 36 yeah. in 12 extensions. Don't, don't quote me exactly on those figures, but I think it was 143 36 and, and about 11 so clearly there, there's 193 members of the United Nations, of course. So clearly they're, they're mathematically it's, it's theoretically possible. Um, there, all I can say is um, it's certainly something that's been sort of in our advocacy toolbox and in our back pocket, and we have raised it with states from time to time, and uh, my impression is there's absolutely no appetite for a United for Peace resolution. Um, why? Um, I think it, it sets precedent. There are a number of other issues uh, going on at the, at the United Nations General Assembly at the moment, and there's one big one which you can probably guess, which they they don't want pressing in the United for Peace resolution, which might uh, open up the door for something else on, on that other, also the least um, issue. But I think also uh, the main thing is that some state would really have to lead it, and would have to campaign around it, and would have to lobby around. And at the moment, there seems to be nobody at the UN who really wants to, to play that role in terms of uh, being a leading advocate for a potential United for Peace uh, resolution. And that's the main reason why we haven't seen it uh, gain any traction. It has been raised by NGOs, um, but it hasn't been raised in any kind of serious and direct way by a state. I was just going to respond to your point about the European Union. I think the European Union, uh, in my opinion, very much deserved uh, the, the prize. In that sense, I think it was uh, an excellent choice and really was one of the greatest contributions that I've seen to peace in that region. I mean, who would have thought you know, France and Germany would be at peace you know, after everything that they've done through? So I think already that was a major accomplishment. In terms of cultural diplomacy, I think the European Union is also a perfect platform for new forms of cultural diplomacy. As soon as the cultural diplomacy is multilateral, as opposed to unilateral, it's automatic that it becomes less selfish. In the sense, if it's, a, let's say, Germany's cultural diplomacy activities towards France, uh, of course, Germany's agenda will be number one. Uh, if it's the European Union's cultural diplomacy, for example, for its European neighbors, etc., suddenly the national agenda is less important, and suddenly it's easier to actually do something that can contribute to the greater good. So I think that's an interesting platform also for new forms of cultural diplomacy, multilateral as opposed to unilateral. Second point I wanted to make is, again, in terms of the topic of this panel, what can civil society do? Uh, is it really necessary for civil society to do anything? We have the UN, we have governments. Uh, I think civil society can do a lot. Uh, one specific example that gives me hope uh, is some of the activities the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy has been doing in the Middle East. Uh, Israel-Palestine is one of those issues that many people, even the majority of people I speak to, have given up uh, and think there's no solution for these issues. Uh, governments seem to be at a standstill. In many ways, one sees we're going backwards instead of forwards. Uh, we did a number of very interesting things this year, actually, alone, in terms of track to diplomacy. 
One was meeting we had earlier this year privately uh, with President Perez, and then also the second meeting with uh, former Minister Lieberman, uh, with a number of our board members, including the former foreign minister, Yasser Yakish, former foreign minister of Turkey. Uh, at a time when Israel and Turkey were not talking, and <laughs> such a meeting was not possible, we were able to do that. And that led to a number of great initiatives in both directions. Uh, Turkey then invited five members of the Knesset to talk to them uh, for meetings with Yasser Yakish as well as others. And some very interesting and attractive diplomacy was accomplished. A second example, we partnered with the Paris Center for Peace, uh, as well as Yada, which is an organization that started in Palestine, and now has almost 200,000 members around the world, Israelis, Palestinians, Lebanese, Iraqis, the entire region. It's actually the largest peace movement in the region. Uh, and ICD actually hosted the first peace summit uh, in Berlin. Uh, it would have been impossible for that group to have met in Israel or in Palestine or any of the countries where actually the leaders were coming from. In Berlin, it was possible. And that was something, again, that it really took an NGO. Uh, I think a government that would have been difficult to do that. Uh, we weren't allowed to take photos of everyone there. Uh, many of the other leaders who came were at quite high risk, actually, uh, coming to a meeting like that and then returning home. Uh, but it succeeded. And they actually have written their peace plan proposal for the Middle East, uh, really the voice of the youth. And I think as we see Arab Spring, et cetera, we recognize uh, that actually the youth do have a voice. Uh, and if one has big numbers, uh, as with the Arab Spring, things can be done. Uh, they received endorsements from Abbas, as well as Perez, as well as Secretary of State Clinton, uh, as well as uh, Amir Azulai, uh, the chief chief of Azulai in Morocco. So it's, it's making some momentum. Again, this will not revolutionize and bring peace overnight. But I think the point is, uh, voices can be heard. And I think civil society does have a role to fulfill. Of course, a different role in different contexts. And one can't take a recipe that works in one place and put it somewhere else. Uh, but in that sense, I'd love to hear perhaps other questions or comments also from the audience uh, if you think there's also a role for civil society. Uh, and then the other sort of implied question and topic for the panel uh, how should governments work with NGOs? Uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing if a government is funding an NGO? Uh, for example, there with Israel and Palestine, also, I think as soon as one were to get funding from the Israeli side or the Palestinian side, things change. Uh, how will that NGO learn to be perceived? Uh, will we be able to bring the same people together? So that's an issue I'd love to throw out there for debate as well. Uh, first of all, what potential is there for civil society when dealing with human rights? And secondly, how should they or shouldn't they perhaps work with governments uh, in a complementary way? So I, I threw that out there for some reflection and meeting. Comments, questions? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the Care International, where we were receiving a lot of funding from the U.S. government, and we encountered a lot of problems in the field because of U.S. anti-terrorist legislation. And I was wondering, what is your opinion on how could the NGOs get around that? Because we all know that they need the money to operate, but they're blocked with this. So yeah. I can jump right in there as a brief response and then I'll turn it to my colleagues. Uh, one has to, especially with cultural diplomacy, be very specific with the strategies for specific countries. Uh, if one has a country like Afghanistan, for example, where one had a very strong hard power strategy, let's say for eight years, it's difficult, I would say, for that same government to then have soft power uh, because you don't really have the agency, you don't have the authenticity because of the hard power before. That doesn't mean they should do nothing, uh, but I think it does mean they need to have different kinds of partners. And that would really be, for me, a great example where civil society, I think, can even do much more than the government. Uh, so one has to be careful how one does or does not take funding. I don't want to say don't take the funding from the government. Uh, a second example that might be helpful for you is in Morocco. Uh, there were some very interesting examples where American culture diplomacy wasn't actually about presenting American culture in Morocco, but it was about actually presenting and privileging Moroccan culture. Uh, there was an organization called I Love Hip Hop in Morocco, uh, and there the U.S. Embassy, as well as MTV, provided some seed funding. But what they were doing was actually just creating a platform. Uh, before that, it was very difficult for rappers in Morocco to actually perform and, and to produce. Uh, and it was actually the US Embassy and MTV, they just created a platform. And it was primarily Moroccan rappers who were actually presenting that. And that's a very interesting vehicle of cultural diplomacy, just to allow voices to be heard that wouldn't normally be heard. A current example in Egypt, actually, we were talking about Ambassador Cynthia Schneider recently, former US ambassador to the Netherlands. She had an interesting uh, project, also with the US Embassy in Cairo. I forget the exact name now. I think it was Sing, Egyptian Women Sing, it was called. And it was sort of like a, a Britain's Got Talent, or American Idol, that she did actually outdoors in Cairo, by uh, giving a platform for Egyptian women to perform. Uh, and it was very, very well received. 
So again, it wasn't about telling American stories to the world. It was about just providing a platform that was very much appreciated in that context. So that's another thing just to think about as we're getting creative, what kinds of cultural diplomacy might allow for dialogue, understanding, and trust to, to come. Uh, cultural diplomacy more about facilitating access as opposed to necessarily telling one story or another story. So that might be another answer. We, we can go into that afterwards in terms of other strategies, but those are some ways in which one can try to get around this problem uh, of actually having a hard power campaign for a certain period of time and then trying to do a soft power.